Hi everyone, this is Pastor Adi. Welcome back to Church in the Office and welcome back to our study of the Book of Mark. But I know today is Palm Sunday, so I hope you have the time to check our devotional on Palm Sunday from our YouTube channel or our Facebook page. But let's get started. You all know I served in the military. I was a draftee, a conscript about 30 years ago in a security troops battalion. And I served in the company that had a police platoon. Our mission was to augment the police force in the city of Ploiești. And I remember the feeling of authority that you get when you, all, you, when you are all dressed up in the uniform and you step up in the middle of the road and you lift up your hand. Things happen then. Cars will stop. Drivers will roll down their windows and you know, present to you small pieces of papers with writings on them. It was, it was great. This, this feeling of authority was, was impressive. But I also remember a small tourist town called Sinai. Our battalion sent my platoon to guard the Pelash castle in the month of February of 1989. Our president was having his vacation in the mountains at that time. We were guarding the outside perimeter, patrolling the streets surrounding the castle. And this was a tourist town and a ski town in the wintertime. So lots of tourists would use some of the small streets as a shortcut from the ski slopes to the town. One of the shortcuts was on our patrol perimeter. It was a sloped, snow-covered, icy road. It was dangerous for anyone that would attempt to go down on that road. We tried to warn off the tourists to stay off that road, and some did listen. But some just kept ignoring our plea, and therefore provided us with free entertainment. But I do remember the frustration of that moment when you had a life-saving message, but people simply didn't care. Well, welcome to the mission of the Twelve. I'm going to read now our text for today, which is Mark chapter 6 from verse 7. 
And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and to not put on two tunics. And he said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Now we jump to verse 30. The apostle returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. Let's look up some of the highlights of this passage. The sending of the twelve and the urgency of the call. Their call to repentance is almost exactly as what Jesus preached in Mark 1. Let me read. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. You can read all the other related passages. Matthew 10, that speaks about the kingdom of heaven. Luke 9, that speaks about the proclamation of the gospel. And here, obviously, Mark, that writes about the message of repentance. But probably the best framing of the urgency is in the words of Christ himself, in the passage that precedes the sending of the twelve in the book of Matthew. Let me read for you. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. That's Matthew 9, 37 and 38. Another highlight is, it, is the list of what to take and what not to take that speaks about the character of their mission. What not to take? No bread, no bag, no money in their belts. Which means that to go on the mission, entirely dependent on the generos generosity of others for food and lodging, that is an expression of humility, of dependence on God, and of trust. Now, the list of what to take is very short. It says, the staff, which is a symbol of a tribal leader's authority, or a prophet's authority. For one example about the staff, just go and read the second, sorry, the fourth chapter of 2 Kings, especially verse 29. The sandals are a metaphor of going, of traveling with purpose, of action. The housing. It says, basically, stay wherever you go, wherever there is a house of peace with a man of peace. I'm kind of borrowing the lingo from Luke chapter 10 here, but the idea is that you seeking your comfort, that is non-essential. Where you go and you find peace, stay there. Peace is the only requisite that you need to have in a place. The two-by-two two part. Well, all I can say here is just to quote Solomon from the book of Ecclesiastes, the fourth chapter. That says this, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Those are the words of the Ecclesiastes, and they allow us to see the importance of having someone to share the burden and the challenges. Another highlight is the shaking of the dust, a common gesture, actually, of the Pharisees. When they were leaving a Gentile town or a Samaritan's town, nothing pagan was supposed to be or to go with them from that city, nothing pagan to defile them. This gesture in Israel serves as a prophetic warning that this is a pagan place and will be cut off from the kingdom of God if they fail to respond. This indicates how serious it is to reject the rule of God. This whole mission of the Twelve, sent now by Jesus Christ, communicates in a dramatic fashion, if you want, the seriousness of the need of Israel to repent now. The message of repentance is that God reigns. The message of repentance is that God reigns. The messengers do not invite Israel to accept God's reign 
if it suits them. They confront people with a yes or no decision so that there can be no middle ground. If they continue in their defiance, they will one day face God. The sending of the twelve in Mark 6 is also a preparation for the later mission. Why? Because it exposes them to the requirement of self-sacrifice and commitment to a mission. And it also acquaints them with the reality of rejection. More of this, if you, can, if you want, you can read in Matthew 10 and Luke 9 about the stark reality of rejection. Now suddenly, the text about our 12 disciples is interrupted by something that seems like a side story, but it's not. The death of John the Baptist. The mission of the Twelve expanded Jesus' reputation, and Herod heard about it. And Herod is afraid, but his fear is not a fear of God. He's afraid of the consequences of a previous heinous act, the killing of John the prophet. What had happened? Herod was troubled by the prophetic words of John that were pointing out his sin. And on top of that, he is under the spell of Herodias, his wife, formerly his brother's wife, who had a grudge against John the prophet. Long story short, Herodias uses her daughter to get Herod to kill John. And now Herod is afraid. We won't go through the whole passage. You can read in Mark 6 when you have time. Just read at your leisure. But John is dead. John's death foreshadows the suffering of the Son of Man and also the suffering of the ones that go out proclaiming his message. John's beheading cast the shadow of death over the disciples' mission. The way it is bracketed by the sending and the returning of the twelve suggests that what happened to John is a preview of what will happen also to anyone who is preaching the same message of repentance into a hostile world. They too will be handed over. They too will have to stand before kings. They too will die at the hands of those opposing the message of God's kingdom. In spite of their success in casting out demons and healing the sick, death and evil loom over the horizon because humankind is a dark place that opposes the message that God is king. How do we make this personal now? This passage is not about how to do mission. It's more about the character of mission. What defines, what is the foundation of what we call the mission of the church? First, mission is urgent. Let's not dilly-dally in minutia and focus instead on our real task, which is the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Two, the mission is dangerous. Remember the take up your cross daily part? That is for me and for you every single day. Three, it requires dedication and sacrifice. And this passage illustrates the fact that my personal comfort is non-essential to the task. The mission comes with authority. We are his ambassadors. Let me quote for you from 2 Corinthians 5th chapter. Paul writes, And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God himself were making this appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And we are to go out there with this message of peace or reconciliation, but also with a message of transformation, a message of restoration and of healing. We do have a message of the gospel of Christ that includes transformation, restoration, healing, and probably the most important, peace with God. In the end, this message is unstoppable. There's one phrase in Acts 17 that describes the Christians, those who turned the world upside down. This message has turned the world upside down by its love, by the power of the Holy Spirit, not by weapons, not by sword. And, it's this, and this will happen again. This is happening actually, actually even right now. It is our purpose as Christians. It is our reason to be as a church. Not doing it 
not going out there with a message, not a choice, not an option. This is who we are. This is what we do. Let me quote in the end one passage from the book of Luke. He said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Luke 10, verses 2 and 3. You have the message. You have the authority. Now go your way and proclaim Jesus. God bless you. Until next time. Don't go away. Check out the comments. You'll find a Zoom link. We will be there in about five minutes from now. We'll try to have a time of fellowship and prayer over Zoom to just be able to uh, relate to one another through the internet. So check the Zoom link. Join us if we can. See you there. God bless you.